Sword Club uh, weekly sword session, online sword session. I don't know what um, to call these, but you know, I'll post post in the chat. What do you think I should call these? <laughs> weekly workshops, whatever. Um, so anyway, tonight we're looking at uh, fainting or faking, deceiving your opponent. Not fainting in the sense of just collapsing. Um, that that's something for after when we go to the pub, I guess. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at how to throw an attack that deceives your opponent how to bump your computer repeatedly so that your screen shakes, um, and also hopefully give you a bit of a sense of what, like what kinds of things you can do to see feints coming. Um, I'm going to go through just the basic principles of fainting, then I'm going to talk about um, some of the most basic feints, and then I'm going to show you some of my favorite feints, which um, if you want to come and join us at uh, you know Mountain Blade, which is our sort of our monthly meetup up in the Blue Mountains um, in Sydney, Australia's Blue Mountains, <laughs> uh, for all of our international viewers, um, you yeah, know then you'll know all of my tricks and can easily defeat me. Which I don't know how I feel about the fact that I can be easily defeated by people I've taught. So yeah. Uh, anyway, let's get started. So let's uh, launch right into it. So I'm going to grab. Actually, might. So now I'm going to use my trusty stick. So I know this is a cutlass lesson, but for those of you who may or may not have come before and um, you know wondering why it is that I'm using a stick, uh, basically the stick shows up a lot better on camera than any of my swords do. Uh, so I use that just to be nice to you, which is going to be double useful tonight when we're doing deceptive movements. All right, so to start off with, just as a quick refresher for anyone who's not come uh, to any of the previous lessons, uh, let's start with the stance we're using. This is the medium guard, which is our learning guard. So to form the medium guard, make an L with your toes. So looking like this, you've got a straight line between uh, your back heel, your front heel, and your front toes. And that is the center line of the fight. That is the line that when you properly extend your arm and don't you know, smack your windows, um, your arm will also be directly above. Directly above. In fact, the straight line extending from of your arm extending parallel to the ground um up, you know fa you know facing forward above the line of your toes is the center line of the fight so anything that comes in below even if it comes in directly below is still you know low but on the center line um just to kind of give you a sense of where that is in space anyway to form the actual guard what you want to do is move your feet to be about two foot widths apart um they can be more can be less Generally, with footwork or with stances, the narrower stance, the small, the less stable you are, but also the small, the smaller the steps you can take. So, any martial art where you have these really, really narrow stance tends to use a lot of small steps to move. Whereas a big, wide step, more stable, sure. Um, although I think when you get to about two foot widths apart, like you know what I recommend, you're stable enough for all purposes. Um, but the wider you are. The, the easier it is to make really big, long footwork. So you see this with um, Italian Sabre, where they have this big, wide stance. And they can make these big, long lunges from miles away, which lets them do these sort of big prime Mullinellos. That was not a very good Mullinello by Italian standards, um, because they're so far away, they're out of distance, and they're never going to get countercut. Uh, for our purposes, for using a British system, about two foot widths, which is a good kind of, it's about as narrow as you'd want. Uh, but it's still wide enough to facilitate a nice lunge, um, but narrow enough that small footworks and small adjustment is really, really easy. And I can use either big or small footwork at my leisure. Anyway, so that's our stance. We want to have our knees bent so that when we move, we don't have to, um, we don't sink down. Um, so if I'm standing bolt upright to move, I'm either going to do these big, weird pendulum steps, which are very committed and very, very unstable, or I'm going to bend my knees, step, and come back up. In which case, why don't I just start with my knees bent to begin with? Because uh, that way all I need to do is step. I don't actually have to bob up and down. And a good test of whether or not your knees are bent enough is if you look at yourself in a mirror or on camera like I am now. I'm actually doing this. You can see I'm using the top of my door frame as a measure for um, how much my head bobs up and down. And I mean, there's a little bit. There's probably like you know this much kind of bob on it. but it's otherwise you know, fairly stable, which means that my knees are bent fairly well. My hands, my back arm is bent at 90 degrees and rests in a fist on my hip. My front arm is bent at about 90 degrees. My forearm is horizontal and I'm holding my tip probably level with my shoulder, give or take, 
maybe a little lower or higher if I've got a longer or shorter weapon, but about that height. The way I like to think of it is if I've got, you know, I want my tip low enough that I can just extend it straight and stab someone in the face. So from shoulder height, if I'm facing an opponent that is the same height as me, I extend out, my tip does go up, but it goes up to about face height and stabs my imaginary tim-shaped opponent in the face. But I also want my tip high enough that if I need to chop my imaginary tim-shaped opponent on the sword arm, I can just extend out and do it. I don't have to move my tip at all and give away the game. So yeah, this is the medium guard. So we're now a little teapot, both short and stout. All right, so from here, we're gonna look at cuts. Um, so there are, in British 19th century sword play, there's seven basic cuts, and then there's a few others that do exist, but are weird um, and not really the subject of this lesson. Um, so cuts one to, and they're numbered conveniently, one to seven. So um, for our first cut, all we do is extend out, hold our sword at 45 degrees and cut straight down. And you can see the angle that my sword is being held at is the angle the cut goes. So when I extend out for cut one, I have hold my sword at 45 degrees and then I travel along that line. So this is kind of a good way to practice your edge alignment if you're in a mirror. Then, so cut one, I'll bring my tip around and now I'm 45 degrees the other way for cut two. I turn my hand over, come back up on the same line for cut three, bring my tip all the way around and straight back up for cut four. And I bring my hand over, so my, uh, my sword is now horizontal and it just whips straight across for cut number five. I then turn my hand over again, so now I'm palm down, come straight back with cut number six. And then I bring my sword all the way up vertical and drop it straight down to do cut number seven and then come back to guard. So let's start by practicing what's called the Moulinet, which is just a wrist mobility exercise that also will help you memorize the cut angles and learn a bit of sword vocabulary. So to start off with, extend to cut number one, cut through, come to the position for cut number two, cut through, turn your hand over and come back up for cut three, turn your hand over, come back for cut four, turn your hand flat, come across for cut five, turn your hand over, come back with cut six, and turn your sword all the way up vertical and drop it down for cut seven and come back to guard. Right, so let's try that a little bit more smoothly. So extend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and back to guard. And again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and back to guard. And once more for luck, extend out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and back to guard. So now let's make that a little bit more complicated. So we're going to turn the Moulinet drill into uh, a standing cut drill. And to do that, all we're going to do is go back to guard between each cut. So extend out for cut number one, cut down, back to guard. Extend for cut number two, cut down, back to guard. Extend for cut number three, cut up, back to guard. Extend for cut number four, flip up, and back to guard. Extend out to cut number five, come across, and back to guard. Extend to cut number six, cut across, and back to guard, and extend to cut number seven, cut all the way down, and back to guard. Let's try that by numbers. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Come back to guard, and I'll show you that from the side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And from the other side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and back to guard. All right, cool. So I want to cover those cuts because they're going to be very, very important in understanding the feints. Because uh, the basic principle of a feint is that you extend to the position for one cut and then you move to a position for another. Um, so this can be done very, very simply. Let's say I'm doing a one-two feint, which is like the most basic feint, but also a fairly effective one. Um, you know, for say a one-two, I'll extend the position for cut number one, flick over position for cut number two, and lunge. But what I can also do is throw a feint with what's called the flying a flying point, where I transition, um, I move my tip um, as I'm lunging. So I move my tip in flight. So I go one, two, or two from the side, 
one, two. Um, and I find flying point is a much better, better way to find it. It's much smoother. So I extend, and then from here, I change my angle as I start my lunge. Um, and that gives my, I find if I go, you know, go one, two, lunge, my opponent's got a bit too much reaction time, um, which they may use to change the parry, but a Kenny opponent is going to use that to launch a counter cut or a counter thrust. Like they're just going to, la they're going to use that time to attack me or that as an opening to attack me, which I don't like. Um, whereas attacking, so extending to one and then transitioning as I lunge has the added, um, has the advantage of I'm already moving, which makes it very, which makes it hard for my opponent to time cut me or to counter cut. Uh, but it also has the advantage of gen it generates a little bit more power. In fact, um, I think it's Burton says in his manual, he's, his manual describes a system that's very, very different to what I'm doing. Um, with your opening cut, you're, on, you're nearly always better off, throw, you're, it's nearly always worth throwing a feint, even if you're pretty confident your opponent's not going to fall for it because it helps generate power because you'll get, you're accelerating your tip a lot more to hit. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of just another kind of fringe benefit. All right, so let's practice that feint. So to start off, we're going to just do it by numbers. We're just going to do the old one too. Um, and yeah, then we're going to go from there. So to start off with, so extend to the position of cut number one and turn over and lunge with cut number two. Extend to one, lunge and 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 two. All right, just show that from the side. Extend for cut number one, lunge and two. Extend for one, lunge and two. Extend for cut one, lunge and two. Extend for cut one, lunge and two. And once more for luck, extend and lunge and two. All right, so now that we've done that kind of as separate movements, I want you to focus on doing it as one smooth movement. And I do want you to focus on taking it slowly at first. Obviously, when you're doing this for real, um, you, you know, you're going to want to do it fairly quickly um, to minimize the amount of reaction time your opponent has. But for our purposes now, let's just try and get it slow and smooth to learn the technique. From medium guard, um, well, faint, 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 and faint. All right, cool. So that basic idea of move to one cut position and then move to another in flight uh, really can be done with from any cut position. Um, and Alfred Hutton, I mean, he's uh, both Cold Steel and the Swordsman, basically says as much. He says, you know, you can theoretically do a cut between really any two, or a feint between any two cuts, but realistically, there are some that are better than others. Um, and then he lists really his favorite, you know, his favorite, his top six feints, um, which one of which is the one, two is the first one he mentions. And that's the most common feint because it is, it is the easiest to learn for how effective it is, whereas the best, ba best ratio of skill to efficacy in that it's easier to learn the most feints, but still a fairly effective feint. Um, and I went through quite a long period of fencing where all my initial attacks were faint, and of those, probably about 70, 80% were as, was a one, two, just because I just, I was like, well, I don't see any point throwing a direct attack. And then, um, and, then I, and then I sort of changed my game a bit from there. But yeah, so let's have a look at some other combinations that are quite good. Let's start looking with the, let's start with a one, four. So the idea is I go cut one, and I whip my tip around, and throw a cut four. I find this is really good. Um, incidentally, John Musgrave Wade is a big fan of this kind of thing where you throw cut one and then whip around with a cut four. Um, and he has a bunch of variants to that where you go for the face, for the opponent's arm, wherever. Um, but it's basically the same thing. So let's start. So extend one. I'll show you this to the side, just make it easier. And then cut four as you come in. So. Extend, cut four. Extend, cut four. 
Extend, cut four. Extend, cut four. Extend, cut four. Extend, cut four. All right, so I find that one's really, really good, uh, especially if you have a very, is very, very good, especially if your opponent's a bit taller than you, because you can throw your number one quite high and then come up and then come in low with number four, um, which I just realized the irony of because at the old solo club, I think I'm the tallest person there currently. So if you're out there and you're taller than me, please start coming to lessons so that I have someone taller than me to fence. All right. So let's look at a similar idea, but on the opposite side, the cut two, three. I find the cut, the two, one feint is kind of difficult. Um, and you, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't land very often. But what I do find is going two, three works really, really well because it gets your, especially if you've got an opponent who likes these kinds of extended parries because it, it prompts them to um, extend their arm, which then leaves it vulnerable to a rising cut. And I'm quite fond of that. So let's have a look at that. So two, three, 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 and two, three. I'm going to show you that from the side just so you can practice it a bit. So two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three, and once more flock, two, three. All right. So the other two, or well, the other two, um, I guess, kind of high percentage feints, the ones that work the most reliably, work off the same principle of changing elevation. Um, so I tend to express this as cut one, cut five, so I'm doing a low horizontal cut against my opponent's belly. Um, some people see it as a high one, low one, because they think of it more as a descent, as the second is more of a descending cut. Um, if you're Richard Burton, you think you think of this as like a cut one, which is done very, very high, because Richard Burton's cuts are very specific, and then like a cut six. Burton's numbering is just a bit excessive. Um, although the man was pretty extra in his life, so it goes with the territory, I guess. Um, but yeah, you get the basic idea. I throw high when my opponent parries high, uh, particularly if they like these big extent, these quite extended guards um, with quite a vertical tip. So you get people who parry in like the old sort of um, you know Miller back sorting style like this. It can be quite easy to come in underneath um, because they've only really got their forte and their basket as a viable powering area. Whereas if you parry in um, a later period style, you have the advantage that um, you know you can be you know your sword from very high up can be guiding your opponent down to your forte and shell. So you don't you've got a you know probably a greater powering area. Um, the advantage of powering like this, of course, is that you can do very very narrow quick parries. Um, so you can cover yourself um, left to right very very easily, but at the sacrifice of being able to cover yourself well vertically. Um, so yeah, it, 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 I'm not saying one is better than the other, um, but I'm saying that like I like one more than the other, which I like to think is the same thing, but it's really not. All right. So let's have a look at that. So extend for cut one, low five. Extend one, low five. Extend one, low five. Extend one, low five. I'll show you that from the side because what I'm tending to do is extend. And then as I come in, I'm actually leaning. I'm, you, dropping, my, I'm dropping my body forward. Um, I'm not just lowering my arm. And the reason I'm doing that is I kind of want to keep, I find if I drop my arm, my head becomes more vulnerable. Whereas if I lean, because my arm is not as far away, or my sword hand is not as far away from my head, I'm a bit more covered, which I quite like. Also, I just find leaning a bit more natural. All right, so let's do a few more. One, five, one, five, one, five, and one, five. All right, now let's look at the same idea, but the other way. So let's look at the two, six. So it is extend out for two, right, come in with a low six. Um, I find with this, it tends to end up going for the hip a lot more. One, five tends to go for the, for, you know, goes to the belly. 
one sixth for the hip. So um, that might just be me though. Like your mileage might vary, and I imagine it would vary a lot depending on your relative height and the height of your opponent. All right, so two, six, two, six, two, six, two, six, two, six, and two, six, and back together. And I'll show you that from the side. So two, six, two, six, two, six, two, six, and two, six. All right. So those are kind of the basic fun feints. Um, if you all have any questions, just type them in the comments. I won't respond straight away because I have to walk next to my computer to actually read them, but I will respond eventually. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> Um, so those are, yeah, so those are some of probably the highest percentage feints, the ones that work the most reliably. Obviously, like I said, you can feint between any two cuts. Um, and then when you get into things like, um, cut number eight, which is a rising vertical cut or, um, you know, false edge cuts, which can kind of happen from really the sort of the three, four and eight angle, um, or anything like that, you can, um, when you get like, you've got a lot of variation in what you can throw. Um, and sometimes it pays to just play with really unconventional feints. Um, the way I sort of found the two, three, you know, going two, three, was I'm like, well, th not many people throw cut number three. It's a fairly, un like, it's a fairly uncommon cut, um, at least in the circles I move in. And so if I can feint to it, I can probably hit a lot of people. And I got that to work quite a bit. Um, well, I should start doing it again. I haven't done it, I stopped doing it. Um, when I started move, when my game revolved less around fainting and more around um, sniping and reposting. Um, but yes, so there's my goal. All right, so let's look at refining those feints and trying to get and looking at different ways to make them work more effectively. So system number one for getting your feint to work effectively is throw a bunch of direct attacks and then throw a feint. So if I'm doing just, I'm going to use the one, two as an example here for the most part, just because it's the, it's kind of the go-to, and it's the go-to because it's a good feint. So we'll say one, two, I might throw cut one, cut one, cut one, just testing my opponent out. And particularly if they parry the same way three times in a row, I can set, that's a pretty good sign that I've gotten them into a, pat, into a movement pattern, at which point I go, all right, so I've thrown a real attack and one, two. Um, so yeah, just test your opponent out with real, um, you know, with real cuts um, and make them real cuts, like, you know, do them as though they were going to land. The worst thing you can do when it comes to fainting is um, start throwing fake cuts. So um, like start going, uh, uh, or just extending or like just kind of flicking out your sword out at your opponent because your opponent will eventually pick what is um, you just extending for this, extending without reason and what is you actually throwing a real attack. And when they do, at the very least, they're gonna stop reacting to your fakes, um, but um, there's every chance that they'll use that to um, actually counter cut you when you do it. All right, so let's actually practice that a little bit. So I'm gonna call um, cut, and I want you to just throw um, a cut number one, and, every, and then every so often I'm gonna call faint, and I want you to throw a one, two faint, um, which kind of will hopefully get you into the habit of doing it a bit more spontaneously, like doing it less on a rhythm. Um, but it also means that you actually get to see me throw feints and kind of get used to seeing what they look like when I do them. Um, unfortunately, the way you learn to defend against feints is you just have someone throw a lot of feints at you until you learn to pick them. Um, but we can't do that solo, unfortunately. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to hit in person. All right, so commands are cut and feint. And don't just throw a cut number two when I call faint. Throw like a one, two faint. All right, you ready? So cut, faint, cut, 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 faint, faint, cut, faint, 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 cut, 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 cut. Faint, cut, 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 
faint, cut, 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 faint, faint, and cut. All right. So a bit of aerobic for us as well, I guess, which is nice. All right, cool. So yeah, that kind of rhythm thing where you just get used to throwing a bunch of cuts and then fainting is really, really good. Um, the other thing that's really, really useful I find is adding some, is having much more jerky movement. So the human eye tends to perceive jerky movement much, much better than it does perceive smooth movement, which is why normally you want very smooth movements because they're, they give you that little bit of extra time before your opponent reacts. But if you want your opponent to react, you actually want a much jerky movement. So again, with the one, two, go on guard, and our first movement is a jerk. I even lean my body. Um, you know, I even leave my body so it's a bigger movement. So I'll go one, two, one, two, one, two. All right, so let's practice that a little bit. So I'm going to call one, two, and I want you to, uh, and I'll put a bit of a, I'll put a bit of a break between each call, but I'm just going to call one, two consecutively, and I want you to really practice jerk and then cut. And if you need to take it a bit slower to feel like you're getting the jerkiness of the movement down, do so. Um, if you can go quick, go quick. All right, so everyone ready? And one, two. 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 And one, two. And back to guard. So you see how that movement, because it's a bit more obvious, can, um, you know, can really have an effect. Um, the other thing that can be quite good is making faces at your opponent as you um, as you faint, like do, do, or even making a loud noise, um, doing an appell. I'm not going to do the appells tonight because I have four dogs, and you know they will then join in the noise making. So, um, and I think my partner really needs to get to bed early tonight. So I'm going to, yeah, going to just uh, withhold that. But um, yeah, making faces, making a loud noise. Adding a bit of drama to, like a bit of drama, a bit of theatre to your feints can be really effective. Um, I used to train with a guy who was like this, who's massively into like narrative role playing games, really would get into character. And yeah, he, he had these very, very, you know, he'd always make faces at you when you, um, when you went to faint. And even knowing that didn't help because you, your lizard brain would overreact. Um, cool. So uh, again, if you have any questions, do put them in the chat. Um, and I will get to them, um, you know, shortly, um, or as soon as I can. But now let's have a look at um, two of my favorite feints, the ones that I've used the most recently um, that I just think are cool, uh, one of which even derives a little bit from uh, French Counterpoint, which we're looking at, um, you know, last year. So, Uh, the first one, this is a bit of a, the first one, what I do is I throw a low cut number one. So I'm throwing this really as though I'm cutting for someone's belly of a hip, but I'm only cut throwing on the extension. I don't want to come forward. And the reason I throw this is that a lot of time what people do is they'll parry and follow. Got a question. Ah, thanks, Mick. Oh, Mick's just saying it's all clear, which is good. All right, so, and especially if you've got someone who's very, very active or very flinchy, this is a really good one because they'll follow your sword down um, at which point you can come around and back in. So it's a variant of the one, two, whereas instead of going, you know, one, two, I go one, do a full cut, and then two. Um, this is also a really good cane technique because it actually, it helps you generate power with the tip. So that's one, cutting all the way through, two. Get from the side, one, two. One, two. One, two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. All right. So fairly, really simple, but it's amazingly effective, especially if you've got, um, like, especially if you've got an opponent um, who's very, very flinchy, very, very reactive. All right. So the other one that I've been getting to work more and more recently that I really like um, takes from the French counterpoint idea of vaults. I'm actually using my footwork to facilitate the feint. Um, but what I do is I throw a thrust in TS, nice and wide. I'm actually not forming opposition the way I normally would. Um, I'm, 
But what I do is I throw this TS thrust on a sideways vaulting step. So move back so you can definitely see my feet. I step and I point my toe. I'm stepping to the side. I'm stepping offline, but I'm pointing my toes at my opponent. Um, and I'm throwing a thrust preferably at their sword arm um, to get them to move or get them to, particularly if they do a big, I want them either to do a very big parry or I want them to try and hit down on my sword. And then once they react, I switch sides and throw a rising three. So it's thrust three. Um, the traversing step is optional. Um, I have just done this just by, I've done this a few times by going vault three and just coming back to line, especially if I'm going for an opponent's sword arm. Um, so do whichever one feels right to you. You can either go vault traverse um, or just vault realign, which, whichever you prefer. So. Let's, let's go. So thrust, cut, thrust, cut, thrust, cut, thrust, cut, thrust, cut, thrust, cut, and thrust, cut. All right, cool. So those are my favorite two feints, or the ones that I've been doing, getting a lot of value out of recently. Um, before we sort of move on, are there any questions, or alternatively, are there any comments? Like, is there anything anyone wants to really add? Um, you know, mentioned before they, um, you know, before we uh, we move on. I really need to like um, more historical anecdotes for when I'm, um, you know questions. Um, <laughs> so Kirok has said, um, interesting, this would be the only use I've seen for cut number three. Yeah, that's fair. I've been trying to throw um, more cut threes when I've been, like, particularly when I've been fencing at home, um, just with my family, as a way of um, kind of getting used to them. I find they're I find they can be quite good for certain angles, like a, an opponent in a medium guard or a cart guard. So um, if my opponent is here or here, throwing a cut three can be really, really good for basically knocking their sword up and coming in and either getting the sword arm or the belly. Um, and if they, you're not used to it, like if you've got an opponent who's just not used to rising cuts, they can be really, really excellent. Um, yeah, so um, um, I also use them occasionally for this as well. I'm not good at that. Um, so, also, the insurance rates are uh, false charts or things. I certainly, yeah. So, let's start with um, false edge cuts. So, most of the false edge cuts described in Hutton are making uh, done to the sword arm. So you do things like I will cut one and then whip up and hit my opponent on the sword arm. So, oh. Okay, is my mic? My mic seems to be working now. I think it's whenever I move, whenever I change windows, it cuts out for some reason. So, but it seems to be working now. Which is good. Right. So, so false edge cuts. Um, so first one is, is I move to the position, extend for a cut number one, my opponent parries, and then I bring my tip all the way around and flick it straight back up. So that's one false edge. Um, and this doesn't need to be done with much of a line understanding because the goal is to get my opponent to parry, because they're doing extend parry if they're doing like um you know, or like, you know, if they're, even if they're coming from extended guard, um, but my goal is to get to parry so I can hit their arm, which is really good because it's safe. Um, I think Jules Jacob actually mentions these as a good option because he says they're safe because you, you do, you're, you're doing them from a much safer distance and you would have faint to the body. So extend for one and false edge cut. 
extend for one, and false edge cut. Extend cut one, false edge cut. Cut one, false edge cut. Cut one, false edge cut. And cut one, false edge cut. I just quickly check the comment. Okay, cool. There's more comments. The, the ever um, my ongoing battle with my own sound system. Um, but yeah, so that's um, but yeah, so that's probably the most common. The other sort of false edge faint is the same thing, but on the other, on the other side, I go cut two, and then I extend for cut two. My opponent reacts, and then I just keep my sword going around and flick up. So two, false edge. 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 And two, false edge. And so similar kind of idea, not as successful in terms of, you know, if you throw a cone, someone moves to tears, even extended like this, it's still a fairly tight parry and it's quite hard to get. Whereas you look at, say, a car parry, you can see a lot of my forearm here, whereas over here, my forearm is fairly flat. So it's much, much harder to hit with a false edge. But where this, um, this parry action or this um, attack becomes really, really helpful is when you're doing it against someone who's left handed. So you might go two, which you'll notice is the other way, and then false edge. This is really uncomfortable because I'm not very good with this hand. Um, so false edge, because um, that will prompt my that will prompt your opponent to parry in cart and then get whacked on the forearm. So yeah, so those are the, kind of the two main ones. Uh, main false edge, you know, cut to false edge cut. Um, the next one you ask is about um, thrust to cut, um, but there is actually a thrust to false edge cut. So what I do is I thrust, um, usually in tears. Um, I thrust, my opponent reacts by parrying, particularly if they parry really high. So you get a opponent who likes to do this sort of stuff where they pull back. Um, I thrust, my opponent reacts, I pull my circle, I circle my tip down, and when it gets to about here, I drop my hand and I drop, I basically, I drop my hand, bring my tip up and pull it back. And that kind of whipping action is what pull, makes um, the false edge cut work. So I extend with the thrust, my opponent reacts, and then I false edge cut them. Thrust, false edge cut. Thrust, false edge cut. Thrust, false edge cut. Thrust, false edge cut. Thrust, false edge cut, and thrust, false edge cut. Um, so yeah, other than that, you do have you do have thrusts, um, thrust to cut feints that work quite well. So um, you the first one you have is you thrust in tears. So it's not really obvious from the video. My hand is in this sort of angle. I'm thrusting to my opponent, probably to my opponent's high outside. They act by parrying. And I actually, I can do this. I actually want contact. So I want my opponent, um, especially if I've got an opponent who likes to really, you know, aggressively beat with their parries, who wants to try and hit me away rather than just, um, rather than just guiding me to a position, um, which is a legit thing to do. And it is like, there are a lot of reasons why you would do that. Um, but if I've got an opponent who does that, I thrust, they beat, and then I just pull through to cut one. So I extend, then I just bring my tip around and throw a cut number one. Thrust, cut one. Thrust, cut one. I'll show you that from the side. Extend, cut one. And I'm actually, the way I like to think is I'm drawing a little circle with my tip. I do actually want to bring my tip back and around, um, doing like essentially a horizontal Molinet um, to make sure I clear my opponent's weapon. If I do this where I just turn my hand over, I might get stuck on the weapon or worse, um, worse still, flick sideways, miss them and expose my sword arm. So I want to extend and then draw a circle with my tip to come in. Extend, cut. Extend, cut. Extend, cut. Extend, cut. Extend, cut. And extend, cut. All right, and then you've got the same thing the other way. I thrust in cut. You know, my hand is in this angle. I'm thrusting to my opponent's high inside. They react, and I just come in with a cut number two. So extend two, extend two, extend two, extend two, 
extend two and extend cut two. So yeah, so fairly, fairly simple, really good way to take advantage of your over opponent's overreaction. Um, and yeah, just kind of a nice feint. All right, so are there any further questions? Um, I'll lean back a bit. I think also being close to my computer tends to cause feedback for some reason. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to try a lot of all these out, which conveniently we are actually meeting up again. So you know, um, I'm gonna have to try fainting again. Um, I have a bad habit of not really doing very much, of not doing proper lessons on faints, um, unless I like really sit down and plan out what I'm gonna do for a few weeks because I don't, I sort of stopped using them after a while because I started using a lot of distance and forearm sniping. Um, cool. Oh, and Kurt wants to know about thrust ending in a faint. Um, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Yeah, I, I think, um, I'm assuming you mean my sound. So yeah, I think it, it is when I change windows that the sound picks up. Ah, oh, thrust ending in a faint. 19th century, not terribly much. Uh, you do get like, you do get stuff in French counterpoint where um, they throw a cut on a lunge and then thrust um, against a fling opponent. But that's not really a feint, that's a redouble. Like, you know, both are, both are full movements. Um, yeah, whereas um, the one place you do tend to see um, a lot of cut to thrust feints is in medieval and renaissance fencing. Um, there you'll see stuff like, I'm just gonna start from right I don't know medieval stuff very well. So if you are a medievalist and you're like, no, this is how you do it correctly, make a video response, you know, we'll have an online, we'll have a fake online argument. Um, whilst behind the scenes, you know, drinking tea and, and laughing with each other where you're driving engagement by pretending to fight online. And then, you know, hopefully we can actually fence for real in person um, and go for a beer after. Uh, in fact, if anyone who, anyone, I feel like anyone who gives me useful feedback to improve my own technique from my videos, I will buy them a beer because, you know, like I'm not perfect. Um, no one's really perfect, really but certainly not me. And, you know, the more feedback I can get to improve the better. But you know, what I might do in a medieval system is I throw a cart, I'm moving laterally and then launch into a thrust, like just keep, keep, move, keep moving laterally. So I'd throw because I'm moving and because I'm moving sideways, my opponent is now in front of me, they parry. I keep moving and come around and thrust them. And the advantage of this is that I've still got the cover of my weapon, um, but I can get around my opponent's guard. So if we're gonna do something similar, if we're gonna do something um, from a 19th century guard where like, you know, you've got a 19th century humorist who's like, hmm, maybe I can use, you know, this medieval stuff to improve my, uh, my, my saber game. Um, what you might do with something like that is throw a cut on a vault. So similar footwork to the faint, the thrusting faint for all, but cut on a vault and launch into a, thru um, a thrust, probably like a high, very high thrust, um, just by following up the vault. So um, again, so cut on a vault and thrust. Cut on a vault and thrust. Cut on a vault and thrust. Cut on a vault, thrust. This is a bit counterintuitive to me, so you, you, you're gonna have to be a bit forgiving. Um, but no, no, I'm actually, you know what? Um, because of Kurt, I'm gonna practice this. So, you know, um, and see if I can actually get it to work when we meet up next. So hopefully, they'll, you know, next time I talk about Facebook, I'll be like, oh, and here's this cool thing that I got. And, you know, I got this idea for an online workshop and yeah, all, and everyone I hit with this is all gonna be, you know, all curse Kurt's name for bringing it up. All right, so. Vault, thrust. Vault, thrust. And once more for luck, vault, thrust. Um, and yeah, like what I was saying before about, you know, a Victorian era humorist. There was humor in uh, the 19th century. So starting in like the 1840s in France and the 1860s, 1870s in Britain, um, people started looking at old historical manuals and actually look at the history of fencing. 
and you start to get people reviving it. Um, and that's why kind of why Alfred Hutton's famous in HEMA circles is because he was one of the first pe he published manuals on um, the revived two-handed sword, rapier, rapier and cloak, sword and buckler systems he was doing. Um, and he really championed uh, essentially HEMA, but in the Victorian period. Although the most famous and prominent example of Victorian era HEMA is uh, quarter star fencing. So you see it, you know, even in Australia, you'll see like displays of single stick and quarter staff. Um, quarter staff in the English language world actually disappeared as a fencing system, kind of disappeared. I and mean, there's actually bits of it in, in uh, the Americas um, in the early 19th century before it reappeared in Britain. Um, but we think that's probably French Grand Breton. Like um, continental Europeans had. Um, two-handed stick traditions that kept going into the 19th century and even into the present day. In Britain, quarterstaff is a really, really important weapon in the time of Shakespeare and going all the way through. And then at the end of the 18th century, it starts to just disappear. And by the 19th century, by um, the 1940s, their displays of quarterstaff were a novelty. Like they talk about French quarterstaff, which is a French Grand Baton, um, as this kind of rare and exotic thing that you know the French do and we know about, and in some cases they do actually talk about in relation to the Middle Ages as well. Um, and then yeah, it's, and then it started to experience a revival and by uh, the 19, uh, by the 1880s, not 1980s, by the 1880s, uh, quarter stuff was a really, really common weapon in, in um, British fencing schools and displays were really common. It was practiced by the military. And yeah, that was actually technically a HEMA thing where they revived an old weapon. All right, so anyway, historical sides, um, you can do the same idea of vault and feint on the other side. So I can vault using a tear, uh, using a tear thrust. Um, sorry, I can vault with a tear with a cut number two, and then throw a high tear thrust at my opponent. Um, on the subject of old systems, some of you people who do older like British systems, even early nineteenth century ones, will notice this is a traverse. Um, but by the late 19th century, the term vault is kind of used. And I find the distinction is a vault is designed to give, to give you a lateral angle against a stationary opponent, whereas a traverse is designed to move you around an opponent who's also moving, who's also circling. Um, so, you yeah, know, I'm just going to use the term vault. So I vault sideways with my thrust. Sorry. I vault sideways with my cut and thrust. Vault cut, 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 thrust. Thank you. Start doing this with like a, a proper mula nail. I can do it. Counterpoint, but I find that you know that's a very different reaction. It's going to get a very different reaction out of your opponent that you can then use to take advantage of the thrust. And sometimes throwing a big heavy cut, if you're going to thrust, if you're going to feint with an extended arm, so I throw my cut and then I feint thrust, can be a really really good way to get a very committed power from your opponent that you can take advantage of. So cut thrust, cut thrust, cut thrust and cut thrust. All right, so hopefully that answers your question, Kurt. Um, so yeah, it's not something you, well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know about Italian or German saber or Austrian saber, like much about continental saber other than um, French. Uh, but I've never seen an English or a French saber manual that where feints end in a thrust. Um, usually they start with a thrust that then they use to transition into a cut. Um, but yeah, there is kind of, there is some prospect of it because it is a medieval thing. Um, and there were people doing revival medieval stuff in the period, um, which I just think is very, very cool. All right. So do we have any more questions or is there any, or even suggestions? Um, you yeah, know, if you have a favorite, fa if you have a favorite, um, favorite faint, you want to mention the, the, the comments, you know, feel free. I'm just going to quickly switch windows, which might cut the sound out. So let's see if we can find out. All right. So did the sound cut out then? 
Uh, so it's interesting. Yeah, looks like my. Oh well, yeah. Um, I guess I. I know a little bit about Maya. Um, uh, so, oh, so crisis five three one four two. That is a large number of crises. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like my life really. Uh, wants to know um, is a thrust harder to make work with a smaller cutlass? Um, it's different. So to get a sense, um, I find that with a longer weapon, it's more obvious what you're doing, so it's easier to get a reaction out of your opponent. The problem is that it's also slower because you've got more, I think it's talk. I might be using physics terms wrong because I'm not a physicist. So if you are a physicist, feel free to educate me in the comments. Um, but basically, it's it takes more energy. There's more inertia in the tip to you so you know with um you know with a longer weapon a feint can be where it's more obvious what i'm doing but it also takes me more effort to get my opponent to um get my tip to the other side with a shorter weapon you know it's much quicker but it's not it's not necessarily as obvious what i'm doing um and yeah sure i can move more slowly but the problem with that is it makes it very obvious that i'm doing a feint um and the few times that I think it was one time where I tried to do slower movements as a feint to get to try and get a reaction on my opponent, and my opponent reacted by counter cutting my arm, so that didn't work too well. Um, but yeah, so it's it's not necessarily easier or harder; it's different. Um, I find actually, you know, it was probably when I started got I started using um, shorter weapon, like playing around with shorter weapons a lot, that I really moved away from feinting. Um, because I found it just wouldn't get a reaction and I might as well just throw the cut. Uh, but yeah, it's, you can do it. It's just a bit different. Um, yeah. So, All right, so I'll just give you a chance to write more questions. All right. Cool. Oh, you're welcome, Crisis. Um, cool. So just so we all know, um, after the lesson where after lesson, we're going to be um, hanging out on Zoom. So I'll, I'll start a Zoom session shortly. Um, the other thing as well, if you can see that, um, is we are asking for donations. So obviously this is, you know, this is free and it's going to continue to be for as long as I keep doing these, which might not actually, might only be like another two month, month or two because COVID's dry, you know, COVID's going to dry up in Australia um, and we can go back to physical classes. But um, yeah, we do have some small running costs, and we also do have um, costs associated with starting back up, like insurance and hall hire. So if you can donate, that would be great. And I'll post um, that link to all those links to. I think my sound dropped out. Then I'll post those links to um, the Facebook event as well. Um, but they should, they'll be appearing in the comments of this videos if you're watching on YouTube and whatnot. Uh, but yeah. Um, Otherwise, I hope you can join us for uh, you can join us on Zoom uh, for our Zoom chat. Um, and yeah, my dogs have decided to go off, which is probably a sign I'm talking too long. But yes, anyway, thank you all for coming. I really enjoyed this. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, like one thing I really like about this is the feedback I get. Like you know, Kirok say talking about like what are the uses for Cut Three. You know, really gets me thinking. Hey, actually, can I use Cut Three? Doubly so because I fence Kirok a lot. So. If Kirok, you know, doesn't, you know, if Kirok isn't expecting cut three, it's worth throwing them. Um, but also like Kurt's comments about, um, you know, Kurt's comments about, um, you know, ending with a thrust feint and Crisis's comments about the difference between cutlass and saber. Um, cool. Oh, we've got, uh, we, we do have one more comment, so we might just keep going. So, uh, favorite feint lately is from Freya's Distressor for saber. Um, palm down, thrust to trigger the outside guard, then dropping the point below the opponent's guard for a false edge cut to the wrist while stepping to the right. That is cool. I I 
I have got to try that. I've got to read through actually um Lois um linked me that just the Lois Vangler is um kind of Australia and you know Australia's sort of premier Spanish fencing expert and probably one of the best in the world. Um certainly very, very good fencer and amazing translator. Um linked me to uh a the, the Distress of Saber manual. So I, I definitely have to check that out. Um, cause it sound it seems really, really different to every other saber system, um, but also but like in a good way, because you know, like people don't use a fencing system for um, you know, what for what like, you know, for three, four hundred, you know, like three or four hundred years without it being good. So I will definitely check that out. Thank you, Kurt. Uh so Kirok has commented, I hate cut three and so do all my friends. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, it's not a very intuitive card, I'll grant you. Um, I, I'm now, going, um, I'm now going to, to try and get it to work more. I'm going to try and include more of it. It should hopefully work. Um, so like I said, yeah, it's amazing. I'm assuming you're talking about the just save a distress manual, um, which yeah, we're actually, I mean, we're due for another, um, we should do another interpretation party. Uh, sometime soon, the same way we did for um, Verville last year. So I don't know, maybe maybe Distress a Saber, see how I feel, see if I can convince Lois to help me out because I could, I do find I do find Distress a bit confusing to be honest. Um, like it when I see it done, it makes sense, but when I try to go from manual to what I need to do, I find I find it a bit, I guess, counterintuitive. But I've not done very much of it. Um, or actually. Old military history sort of book thing I was reading years and years and years ago uh, claimed that Spanish fences were incredibly well respected, and a lot of that was a result of the amount of training time you'd need to do to get good at Spanish fencing meant that by the time you're at all competent at it, you had done some. You just you sort of just went from being you know from kind of being all elbows and knees, all elbows and knees, and also a sword in there somewhere to just destroying everyone through superior angles. Um, so yeah, there might there might actually be something to that where it's it's kind of it's kind of one of those long term you know um, I forget the term is a term in competitive gaming for strategies that are very hard to to learn and then execute, but once once you get them, once you actually learn them, they're very very powerful, like like really high level strategies. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly can't, I can't remember the term, but that maybe that I don't know maybe that's just Reza. maybe it's just I'm very bad at it. Um, I don't know, but you know, anyone who any distress practitioners who disagree can come fight me. <laughs> I mean that in a friendly way, like you know, um, I actually think it'd be fun to fence cross systems. Um, cool. So, are there any more just before we finish off um, and move to Zoom? Are there any more questions, comments, compliments, condemnations, complications? Cool. Oh, well, I'm just going to start. I'll start launching the Zoom now. I think I'm going to keep talking here until the Zoom session is launched, just so there's a continual stream of Tim. Um, <laughs> just probably it'd be like a good name for like an indie band, you know, stream of Tim. So all of you aspiring musicians out there, you know, um, <laughs> I've given you some inspiration. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um, but no, I think that's good. Um, <laughs> oh. Thank you, Nick. I mean, I'm glad you liked it. Um, yeah. Just, I don't know what that's in regards to, Kira. <laughs> I, I really don't know. You have no, I'm hoping it's because you have no more questions or comments. We can just move to Zoom. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think, um, also, with these questions, like especially once we get to the end and there's not more sort of technical questions, do feel free to ask me um, historical questions as well, um, because there is like I am also a historian of some type. Um, I, I've been told I shouldn't be as down on myself, you know. Like I do actually have a mark, you know. I have like an honors thesis in um, history in 19th century history, specifically looking at Alfred Hutton. So you know, there are some questions I can answer, but also, it's just, it's also helpful for me because sometimes I'll get a question I can't answer and then go away. 
um, and come back. Um, oh, mix, mix head. I think this would apply really well to Bowie knife. Uh, yeah, actually, the th the um, the thrust, the, th the thrust and cut feint would apply really, really well to Bowie knife. But also those kind of cut and then move into a thrust feints work really, really well with knife. Um, because like work really, really well with knife because um, they like because they um, trigger your opponent to counter cut you. So they're really, really good. Anyway, so Zoom is launched. So anyway, I'm going to switch over to Zoom if you want to chat there so we can actually talk more in person. Um, but, you know, if you're not coming to Zoom or if you're watching this as a recording, so I do kind of have two audiences, which is weird. Um, thank you for coming. Um, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, share it about. Uh, if you can spare some money, donate. And, yeah, I'll hopefully see you um, next week. Bye.